This lecture is about analysis of variance, better known as ANOVA. This lecture is divided into four parts. In this first part, I'll provide a brief overview of what ANOVA is for, how to perform it in R, and how to interpret the output, using a one-way ANOVA as an example. In the second part, I'll explain how ANOVA actually works. In the third part, I will cover two-way and multi-way ANOVA, and in the last part, I'll address the multiple testing issue that arises from it and show you how to fix it. ANOVA is a model for comparing any number of group means. Consider it a generalization of the t-test, which we use to compare two group means. When you use ANOVA, you will typically first perform an omnibus test to see if there is any difference among the group means. Only if this test is significant is a post hoc analysis performed to see which group means differ. The point of this two-step approach is to provide some protection against false positives, because it discourages looking at individual differences if there is no significant overall difference. I will demonstrate this through an example with three groups. Suppose we measure systolic blood pressure of hypertension patients undergoing different treatments. Since the start of the study, six of them have been undergoing treatment by thiazide, which is a kind of hypertension medicine. Six others have been undergoing treatment by another kind of medicine called a calcium channel blocker, and the last six were given a placebo and act as a control group. If after some time we measure the systolic blood pressure of these patients, we can use ANOVA to answer the following questions. First, the omnibus test. Is there any difference in mean systolic blood pressure among these groups? And then the postdoc to find out which group means differ. The first step is to enter your data in R. You can either do this manually, as I've shown here for this example, or if you already have an Excel file, you can save it as a comma-separated file and read it with read.csv. In some countries, including the Netherlands, a comma is used as a decimal separator instead of a period. If you have a file that uses a comma as a decimal separator, you can simply use the alternative read.csv2. Once the data are read correctly in R, the first thing you should always do is try and make some relevant plot. This will make it a lot easier to relate the output of whatever method you're going to use to the properties of your data. It is also a quick way to verify that your data are indeed read correctly into the software. The plot shown here is a series of box plots. These are explained in Introduction to Bias Statistics, but in short, we can see that the patients using a placebo have the highest systolic blood pressure, and that thiazide appears to be the most effective at reducing blood pressure. The difference between thiazide and CCB is a lot more subtle than the difference with the control group. We can also see that the variances of the groups are more or less equal and that there are no apparent outliers. This is all useful information for later on in the analysis. Remember that these are just 6 patients per group, so even if there appears to be a difference, it might not turn out to be significant. And that is what we're going to find out with ANOVA. Now let's fit the model using the AOV function in R. Here we create an object called ANOVA by making a call to AOV. Systolic blood pressure is the outcome, and the explanatory variable is the type of treatment, so thiazide, CCB, or placebo. The last argument tells R where to find these variables, namely in the dataset that we just created called DF. Before we run any kind of test, we have to consider whether it is appropriate. With model diagnostics, we can look for violations from the assumptions that ANOVA makes. In descending order of importance, ANOVA assumes that measurements are independent, deviations from the group means are normally distributed, and that groups have equal variance. The assumption of independence means that each observation comes from a distinct experimental unit. This cannot be checked through diagnostics and is inherent to the study design. The other assumptions can be checked through model diagnostics. In addition, a single influential observation can have a large effect on the estimates and p-values, so we also use diagnostics to check for outliers. This is what visual diagnostics of an ANOVA look like. The first plot is used together with the lower left plot to check whether equal variance is a reasonable assumption. In ANOVA, the fitted values are the estimated group means, and the residuals are what is left behind when we subtract the group mean from each observation. In other words, this plot simply shows how much each group's members differ from that group's average. If variances were unequal, you would see larger deviations in one group than in another. 
In the lower left plot, residuals are transformed in a way that turns them into positive numbers. This allows us to see whether the variance is increasing when the mean increases, which is often the reason for unequal variance. The upper right plot is a QQ plot. It can be used to check for serious deviations from normality. The solid red line is where the observations would be expected, and the dashed line form a 95% confidence interval for checking whether deviations are noteworthy. A rule of thumb for QQ plots is to pay more attention to the center of the plot than the lower left and upper right corner. Typical problematic deviations are a clear parabolic shape, a staircase, or an S shape. The last plot shows the Cook's distance. This is a measure for outlyingness. If any observation exceeds a Cook's distance of 0.5, then it is at least anomalous and you should look into it. If an observation exceeds 1.0, then it is statistically an outlier. That's a lot to take in at once. So let's see if you can correctly identify which assumption is violated in the following set of diagnostic plots. You can pause the video if you want, and I'll reveal the answer in a second. If you look at the QQ plot, you will see a clear staircase. This occurs when you have discrete data, like counts, which cannot be reasonably approximated by a normal distribution. So the answer is normality. Here is another example. Again, you can pause the video if you want, and I'll reveal the answer in a moment. If you look at the residuals versus fitted plot, you will see a cone shape. As the mean increases, the spread around the mean does too. The same is reflected by the skill location plot. The variance is clearly increasing along the fitted values. The QQ plot shows somewhat of an S shape and one observation has a Cook's distance of 0.5. But these are not signs of outlyingness or non-normality. They are caused by the unequal variance. This is why I recommend looking at all four diagnostic plots simultaneously. One final example before we continue. You can pause the video and I will show the answer shortly. This is an example of a strong outlier, hallmarked by a Cook's distance of 1.0 or greater. Notice how there appear to be problems in all diagnostic plots, but each can be traced back to a single observation marked number 17. Especially the scale location plot is interesting because it shows why an outlier can be problematic. Namely, this observation pulls so hard on the group mean that all other members of this group end up being farther away from the mean. As a result, it would seem like the variance of the first group is larger, but this is all caused by a single outlier. So what if you conclude a severe violation? Although you can't see it from the diagnostic plots, if the observations are not independent, then ANOVA is not a valid approach. The standard errors, confidence intervals, and p-values will be misleading. In case of pseudo-replication, so that is measuring the same thing in doublets, triplets, or even more for the purpose of reducing measurement error, you could consider averaging the pseudo-replicates, which will give you a single true replicate per experimental unit that has less measurement error. In case of repeated measures or spatially correlated observations, you can use a mixed effects model. In case there is a severe deviation from normality, the first thing to do is consider whether normality is a reasonable assumption in the first place. There are plenty of models that can assume other underlying distributions, like for example generalized linear models. You could also consider using a test or model that makes no assumption about the underlying distribution at all. For example, you could run a series of Wilcoxon tests and apply multiple testing correction. In case of unequal group variances, you can consider transforming the response variable. For example, if variance increases with the mean, then perhaps what you're studying is multiplicative rather than additive, and you can use the logarithm of your outcome variable. Another option is to use robust regression, which doesn't care about equal variance. It is most important to realize that even with unequal variance, ANOVA is still a valid approach. It is simply less efficient, meaning it has lower statistical power to reject the null hypothesis if it is false. In case of a problematic outlier, you want to try and find out why it is outlying. Never remove outliers from your dataset unless the observation was not recorded correctly, there was some error in experimentation that you can trace back in the lab journal, or the data is otherwise corrupt. If you do not have valid reason to remove the observation, you can use robust regression. 
Regardless of the type of violation, the first thing to do is always to consider why the assumption might be violated. A violated assumption sounds like a problem, and it is in the context of ANOVA, but in the context of your research, it can reveal valuable information about the process being studied. Once we've established that ANOVA is appropriate for this problem, we can conduct the omnibus test. This asks the question, is there any difference among the group means? The null hypothesis is then that all means are equal. Let's use a significance level of 5%. You can simply run it by using the summary function on your fitted model. For now, all you have to look for is the p-value of this comparison. In this example, it is extremely small. So we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there must be a significant difference in means. Now that we know that, the next question is, which group means differ significantly from one another? For this, we use Tukey's honest significant difference, which is similar to a series of t-tests with multiple testing correction applied. In R, you can use the function Tukey HSD on a fitted ANOVA. If you print this object, you will see the estimated difference, the lower and upper bounds of a 95% confidence interval, and a p-value for each of the comparisons between groups. Like we saw all the way at the beginning in the box plots, there is a very clear difference between the placebo and the treatments. The placebo group has, on average, a systolic blood pressure that is 22 higher than the thiazide group and about 17 higher than the CCB group. The CCB group has, on average, a systolic blood pressure that is about 5 higher than the thiazide group, but this difference is not significant. Remember that this is just a sample, and apparently, given the sample size, the variance, and the number of comparisons made, we have insufficient evidence to conclude that CCB and thiazide differ on average. You can also plot the object made by Tukey HSD. This will show a 95% confidence interval for each of the comparisons. If these do not contain zero, then the difference is significantly non-zero at a level of significance of 5%. The confidence interval for the difference between CCB and thiazide includes zero, whereas the other two do not, so the conclusion is the same. However, this plot provides more information than just three p-values, so for any kind of report that includes an ANOVA, I recommend that you include a plot like this one. To summarize, ANOVA and R works as follows. Enter your data, fit an ANOVA, perform visual diagnostics, check the omnibus test, and if the omnibus test is significant, perform a postdoc analysis. That concludes the first part of this lecture.